What I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask Robert Perry, if he could, to contribute some of his personal experiences, not only how he got into the field, but his perspective on the field. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight. I'm going to be wearing my reading glasses because I can no longer see up close. My interest in this topic started when I was 16 on a night that really did change my life permanently. Since first grade, I had a best friend named Kevin, and we did everything together. Uh, but at this point, we were growing apart. I had begun an avid inner life. I was thinking about big things, and I needed an outlet for my thoughts, and Kevin just wasn't it. He wasn't interested, so I felt bottled up and alone. Uh, another source of my loneliness was the fact that I didn't have a girlfriend. So uh, I felt lonely on two different levels. And oddly enough, all of that changed on one night. I'd been looking forward for months to seeing the remake of the movie, King Kong. I was 16. I assumed Kevin would go with me, but as opening night came, I was shocked to discover he didn't want to go. So I asked another friend of mine from school, Darren, to go with me, and he went. And as we sat in the theater, we had a great conversation, just the kind I was wanting, and it seemed like a significant moment. And as it turned out, Kevin and I never did another thing together. That was the end of our relationship, without a word spoken. I'm not exactly sure why, it just was, after 10 years. And Darren became my new best friend, and he was that outlet that I needed. I always thought it interesting that on, on one night, I lost my old best friend and gained a new one. But that's not the synchronicity part of the story. The other part of the story involves uh, Susan, a girl I went to church with. Uh, she was in a very serious relationship with Mike, and it was very volatile. She felt utterly controlled. It was even at times violent. Uh, she felt totally stifled. So she wanted freedom. And out of this freedom, she secretly planned a party for her friends for when Mike would be out of town. So she planned this way in advance. And the day before the party was to happen, Mike says his plans have changed. He's going to be in town. So now she's on the spot. She makes up a lie that, you know, well, she's going to a friend's party. She had conveniently scheduled it at a friend's house. But then she spent the whole next day thinking, what kind of relationship is this where I have to invent these elaborate lies? So the next night at the party, he arrives, and she does the obvious thing and, and breaks it off. And strangely, uh, it was the same night as my movie. Uh, and shortly afterwards, she used her newfound freedom to ask me out, and we started dating. Anyway, I now had two new relationships. I had a girlfriend I could share my feelings with, and a best friend I could share my thoughts with. I felt like I had gotten a new life. And what was remarkable to me is it all happened basically on one night at 8 o'clock. <laughs> and that was my first experience that I know of, of, of a pattern that was become very familiar to me. And I want to say a bit more about that pattern. In simplest terms, the pattern involves two events that occur together in time. And these two events just happen to share a long list of common features or parallels, as I call them. And that was really true in this case. As I thought about it, my movie event and her party, while different in many ways, had a lot in common. And I want to read you a list of some of the things they had in common. Okay. First is a relationship between two teens, myself and my best friend, Susan and Mike. And there's this mounting tension in the relationship, in both relationships. One person feels stifled, unable to express himself or herself. The teen plans in advance a social event that's very important to him or her. In this event, it's also very important for the other person in the relationship to play their assigned role. 
which was to come or not to come, depending upon which relationship. Yet at the last minute, this person does exactly the opposite. And this causes, in both cases, something to snap. The teen suddenly realizes he or she doesn't want to be in this relationship. This ends the relationship and simultaneously opens the way for a new one. It seemed remarkable to me that these two totally independent events could have that same storyline and be happening at the exact same time. It just didn't seem like chance. I know it could have been chance. It didn't feel that way. That these two events could just happen to be that parallel and just happen to change my life in such major ways. And the change actually wasn't short-lived at all. Um, I ended up marrying Susan. We were married for 20 years. We have two children, 18 and 21. Uh, Darren and I both went on to get into A Course in Miracles together. Um, and 30-some years later, that's, that's the career we both still have in, in different Course in Miracles centers. Uh, so in a significant way, I'm still living within the after effects of that one night. And I'm actually not all that surprised by that fact. I mean, it's been actually 30, 33 years plus. Uh, it just seemed like, it seemed like there was something, I don't know what, that, that knew the pivotal nature of those two relationships for my life. And something, and this is, again, is how it felt, I can't verify this, something that arranged the pivotal nature of that night. It felt like somehow that night was some kind of extrusion of, of some sort of blueprint for my life, like it had the bird's eye view. And for something that had that kind of view of my life, I wanted to know more. Let's move on, if we could, to Professor Bryton, please. Thank you. I was a lonely eight-year-old in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Um, my father knew I needed a dog. Um, he tried with two of them. Uh, it didn't work. Um, they were very sad that I was sad or that the second one died. He was too young from his mother. And got a dog finally um, who liked to gnaw on trees. And so I called him Snapper. He was teething, but I, I didn't know. Snapper and I were buddies, um, real good buddies. And then one day I came home from school and uh, he wasn't there. And I said, uh, Mom, Mommy, where, where, where is he? And she said, I don't know. Um, why don't you go to the police station? Maybe they know. That's pretty funny, isn't it? The police station? Well, I didn't know it was funny, but it was something she could say to get me out of the house and buy some time. So I got in the, on my bike and rode over to the elementary school, uh, Moreland School and down Kinsman and past Benny Blauschild's automobile store and then across the front of the school and over the rapid transit. Any of you know Cleveland, there's rapid transits. And it's a big street. I hadn't been on that street before. and had to cross over this street and went up the st steep stairs and a little hill up into the police station, and I was crying. I, I was crying. I was, where's my, do you, do you, sir, do you know where I'm the guy behind the, the desk, do you know where my dog is? And he said, sorry, son, I don't know where your dog is. Uh, and my, I was filled with tears going down those stairs, getting on my bike, and I, I just started going home, and I went along the street with the rapid transit, a way I'd never gone, and that's the key, a way I've never gone, looking for something and there he was. I could tell by his walk, his sideways walk. It was me, and it was, it was him, it was me. Uh, we, we ran into each other. He hopped up on me and looked at me as if uh, to say, where are you? Where, you? where have you been? And we went home. Years later, um, finishing my residency in psychiatry, uh, I'd gone home um, from my father's tombstone unveiling, the Jewish tradition of within a year of the death to um, unveil the tombstone. And I was, flew in from San Francisco to uh, Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, instead of going on the day I was supposed to, uh, went to Philadelphia for a day to visit a friend of mine who just happened to set on fire an ROTC building in Hawaii to protest the Vietnam War. 
and is going to go to jail with Jeb Magruder and others of that time. Uh, and I wrote a letter for him. And because of that day's, I was delayed a day and got on a plane in, in Dallas, had to change uh, planes uh, to San Francisco on American Airlines. And as I was walking down the aisle, I uh, found a seat and sat down. And there's a woman sitting by the aisle seat who uh, had a big watch on her hand that I hadn't noticed and asked me what time it was. Uh, we began to talk, uh, and I told her tombstone unveiling. She knew what it was. She was Jewish. Her father had just died. Her father had just gotten remarried. Her brother had just gotten married. She just returned from Texas with a, a hepatitis, reco recovering from hepatitis. And that was a marriage made in heaven, which, as I look back, uh, thought my father and perhaps her father had something to do with. And these are the attributions that we do. Uh, two men trying to hope for the best for their children. And I've certainly been very lucky to keep that coincidence going still in my life. A, co a year or so later, uh, I was, um, a, a year before that, a year before that, a year before my, um, I met Paula on the airplane, I was, it was 11 o'clock at night in my San Francisco um, Victorian building. I was by the sink in the kitchen and I was choking. I was choking and I couldn't get it out of my throat. There was something in there and I couldn't get it out of my throat. It was 11 o'clock p.m. on February 26, 1973. I found out the next day that in Wilmington, Delaware at the same time, which was 2 p.m., in Wilmington, Delaware, my father was choking on blood in his throat and died. That realization that I was choking when he was choking led to a much more open sensitivity to stories that probably some of you have here of feeling the pain of people with whom you're close. These connections plus playing football and imagining almost like Jeanette in their housekeeping. Why was she cleaning the house the day before in preparation for something? I was playing football in college, put two dummies down in front of me, turned around with the football, facing away from the dummies, pretended as if I caught the football over my shoulders, turned around, grabbed the football, and ran between the two dummies. And two days later, playing against Johns Hopkins, I went to Swarthmore Division Three. Swarthmore has no more football. I turned around, a 90-yard punt, turned around over my head. There's two guys coming straight at me. I run straight through them and go 90 yards for a touchdown. There's something that sometimes we can keep that we are preparing for, and we don't know just what it is. Thank you very much. Outstanding. Dr. DeBell. So uh, I'm a psychiatrist, and to me, one of the things I guess I've learned in life is that everything is context that you can hear in our different stories. You know, these events hit us in different points in our lives. So mine is really of a similar nature, but different for the context, and it, it took a religious or a spiritual kind of turn. So I say that because it's important to understand and my interpretation of these events, that when I was young, I was very religious, and then... In college, I kind of became an existentialist and gave it all up. And, uh, you know, I didn't see any signs at all of any real living vital religion. And I said, well, until I see a sign of that, I'm really not going to have any interest in it. So I became a psychiatrist, a very rational person. I mean, after, of course, dropping out of college, trying to be a hippie, but failing. Uh, and so I came back, and I was always had this tendency to want to drop out. And I was really... And I say this because I end up at the end of the talk, you'll find an extremely rational approach to spirituality. So I, I want to just overemphasize a little bit that it's not my nature. I, I am rational, but really I'm inside, I'm kind of a dropout who really is anti-society and all emotion. Uh, but synchronicity led me in another direction. So how that happened is when one of my... Uh, Vacations. I had a lot of friends and were Brazilians, and so I was down in Brazil where they have this a lot of spiritismo, and I was very interested in that, like a, you know, like a cultural phenomenon. You know, as a psychiatrist, rational, I thought it was all 
bunch of crock, but it was great for a vacation. You know, I loved the samba, I loved dancing, I loved the sun and the beach, and this was part of it. And my friend who had that interest was always trying to make fun of me, and I was making fun of her. So she gave me Jung's book on synchronicity. So I sat there and I read it, and as I was reading it, I had this thought, you know, go to the botanical gardens and a tree will show you another dimension. And so I said, well, I'm open-minded, I'm reading this, it makes sense, let me go, because I love trees. So I went with some friends who knew the garden, and I had beautiful trees in the botanical garden of Rio, and I went around hugging all the big trees. Uh, I loved to hug them, I smelled them, I looked, nothing happened. So I kind of gave up, and I sat there on a bench, uh, just enjoying the sun. It was morning, this beautiful air. And I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, this little skimpy tree across the way, this leaf, I noticed, came down, and the stem went right in my hand like that, and it had this, this leaf that was that big, flaming red, just landed in my hand, just like that. And I had this thought, just like I thought, I flashed on Dumbo uh, in the cartoon with that feather that he could fly, and I said, gee, I can fly. <laughs> And so that to me was, you say, it's not really spiritual. I didn't know what to make of it. Uh, and as I go on, I'll just tell you a little bit about why that led me toward a rational approach. You know, I wasn't spiritual. I had no interest. It didn't mean anything. But I said, but this is interesting. So I developed this dialogue. And I just want to tell you a few other experiences because I'm kind of focused. And the point of synchronicities to me is the more you're focused in a way, the more you tend to attract things. So I... You know, there are a lot of experiences I had there in Brazil, and you know, I'll just mention a couple of them. So, I always had this idea that when I'm connected with this other dimension, I'd be protected because I'm a good guy, and you can do that. There's no danger, even though they hear lots of stories about black magic and things. I said that would never happen to me. So I decided, well, I'll go and I'll kind of talk to this tree about it. I was, why not? Uh, so I went and I sat down. I liked the trees, so I sat there and I started this dialogue. I said. You know, this may sound like a silly question, but is it dangerous at all to do this? And at that very second, a quiet morning, beautiful, this huge nut, this big, I swear, came crashing down in a tree like 10 feet away and just hit the ground like a thud. You know, that kind of was pretty good for giving me a clue that there was some danger involved. You know, not everything was, was a kind of uh, that way. And, you know, another time, just to say how... Uh, and I'm saying these stories in a series so that you get that it's possible to kind of establish a dialogue. So then I went back once on my birthday and I was kind of feeling a little, because it was kind of nice, and I sat there and I said, I'm looking down at the ground, a little embarrassed, and I said, oh, today's my birthday. And at that second, right at the spot I was looking, a little flower dropped. So I said, wow, well, that's interesting. You know, that's great. And then just one last thing, again, to make the same kind of point of how complex this is. Uh, I went back and I was getting ready to leave Brazil. I lived there for a year, uh, enjoying the beach, the sun, the samba, the, just everything there was great. Uh, and so I wanted to say goodbye to this tree. And I said, well, you know, in Brazil they have all of this spiritismo, condomble, they tie ribbons on things that they like. So I said, well, I'm going to take one of these ribbons. And then, you know, I'd like to tie it on the tree just to see, but I don't really know what I'm doing. So I said, well, I'm going to go there and say, well, I don't know whether this is a good idea. I want to be respectful, but I'd like to tie this ribbon on the tree. Is there anything wrong? And at that exact second, a bee came right from the distance. This hugest bee that I'd ever seen stopped right there, circled my head until I ran away with fear. <laughs> and I like these stories because it kind of says that the more you engage this kind of dimension, the more you kind of get a kind of consistent feedback. And over years and years and years, it gradually led me to a kind of a... At that time, I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in a higher power. I didn't believe in a spiritual dimension. And the following that trail, because just like those kind of situations fit together, it kind of gradually led me toward a strangely, for me, rational approach to spirituality. So those are synchronicities in my life and how they kind of role that they got me interested in them.